Hello darkness, my old friend. You know who sang that song? Who? I think it was Simon and Garfunkel. It was made from, um, there's a movie that came out in like the late 60s, early 70s called The Graduate. I do not know. It's a fantastic movie. I highly recommend it. If you're having like a mini life crisis before uh, or after finishing undergrad, watch that movie. Damn. But I, I think that to. song and then a few other songs were made for that movie. I didn't know it was that old. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't think I am. No. And if it is, we'll take this out. But anyways, welcome Hi. back to another episode of Beaker Bros. We're recording. Bop, bop. Beep, bop, bop. Bye, 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 bye. Welcome back to another episode of Beaker Bros. I am Sonia. And I'm Januti. Januti, how are you? As good as I can be. How are you? I got a PSA. Also, oh, this, I got a P. <laughs> I, like, oh. I already went. We're okay. good. I have a PSA. But also, we have Rio over here. Hey. Yep, just the little uh, ambiguous, not ambiguous, ominous voice mm -hmm. in the background. Mm -hmm. um, my PSA is this. I just drove through Armageddon. To anyone that drives on a highway during freak weather totally understand it i'm someone that just engaged in that sometimes it happens sometimes we got to go from point a to point b during times that are not ideal but if you are amongst those people let's try to drive better that's all i gotta ask that's all i gotta say <laughs> do better especially on the poorest of it that was terrifying i saw three accidents happen the first accident i saw this ford f-150 typical <laughs> driving god knows how fast in like literal torrential snow i saw that truck fly by in my head i was thinking you know what what are the odds they spin out a knock on wood like hoping it doesn't happen because that's scary 15 minutes later i saw that truck and no like, this, way. like the pull over lights were flashing oh my god so don't be dumb drive slow drive safe if you really got to get somewhere leave early even, hey, I left early, I was still late for this uh, episode. But all I gotta say is, be safe out there, do better, drive better. Am I a great driver? Debatable. But, I try. Anywho, on to today's episode, the pertinent topic of the day. We're gonna be talking about AI in academia. Let's start off right. What is AI? To be fair, I tried to research this and try to understand what AI is and for my brain who's not really understanding this field. It was a little hard. But the definition you have was actually pretty good, right? Yeah, well, I'd like to think so. Yeah. So this definition that we're taking or using for this episode, it's from a guy named Iqbal Sar Sarkar. My apologies if I'm butchering their name. From um, Bangladesh. Hi there, if this is you. Oh, yeah. they have two affiliations, yeah. excuse me. So from Melbourne, from Australia, and Bangladesh. Hello to you. Yeah. Why are you treating them like a Martian? <laughs> Hello from the Great Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Bangladesh is pretty close to India. It's... What? We're getting so sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> like geographically, they're not far. The word artificial intelligence has... It's quite a broad definition. It encompasses many things. Keep it together. I'll read verbatim what um, this individual um, from Bangladesh from Bangladesh and Australia, multiple affiliations. Artificial intelligence, aka AI, as we'll be commonly referring to it in this episode, and you may see in literature as well, and other YouTube videos and podcasts, is a broad field of computer science concerned with building smart machines capable of performing tasks that typically require human intelligence. In other words, we can say that it aims to make computers smart and intelligent by giving them the ability to think and learn using computer programs or machines. So for example, can think and function in the same way that people do. So it's essentially saying that using the information provided through various programs um, from, if we want to think about ChatGPT, using the information that's broadly available on, you know, the online through the World Wide Web, as some may refer it to, um, they, uh, yeah, can just use the information that's currently available to create an output that benefits, uh, I guess, humans for the sp their specific requirements. I think what's really cool to also, like, note is the fact, the evolution in AI, how it began, began as learning simple rules, but now 
it's kind of been programmed to understand even more complex patterns by just looking at lots of data. So I think that's also really important. Too. I'm gonna make a oh. slight side comment here, that, but that's a really like important comment that you said there. But no, sorry, did I? No, no, off? go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, did you ever watch the uh, the show Simple Rules growing up? Seven Simple Rules? No. I don't remember what it was, I just remember Simple Rules. It's like a, about a kid in high school, I think, and she's learning simple rules to... Eight simple rules? Eight simple rules. That it's makes sense. Anyways. Anyways. Um, that just reminded me, I haven't heard simple rules in a sentence in a long time. <laughs> so that's sort of like a broad definition of what AI is and its applications within like a human context. But Janini, what about in academia? How have you personally used AI in, let's say, schooling or... I guess you're learning. I think it's important to acknowledge AI in the use of like research, mm -hmm. right? So I think in, I mean, one example that I use AI in maybe like in everyday life too is things as like even um, creating this podcast I'm like today, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of putting into chat GPT or whatever AI form there is and being like, hey, this is kind of the setting of the podcast this is kind of the topic i wanted to talk about can you help me curate different outlines for the podcast so i think that's one way that i use it more in an everyday instance mm -hmm. in terms of research i haven't really gone in, into it of using ai i would say because the ways that like the examples that i've discovered ai being used right now is a bit more complex than the way that i would use ai in my research because the research itself is different um, but yeah, that's just kind of my perspective. What about you? I use, I, it's insane, thinking back to like the first couple years of university, how, you know, chat GPT wasn't really available, or uh, like high school, whatever. Chat GPT is probably used on a bi, you know, bi-week, not bi-weekly, like every other day, or if not every day, mm -hmm. in like my work, in school. Whether it's like doing a mini literature review, I've used it before to uh, to like I use R for some of my work, which is like a like a, an analysis coding program, and there are certain like functions and um, what's it called like uh, analysis methods that I didn't know how to perform on R, so I put what I needed to do into ChatGPT and gave it very specific instructions and then it gave me the output for how to perform the function oh. that I needed to on R. And you can use it for literally anything like R. I've used it for Stata before as well. SPS, SPSS is like more automated, kind of like Excel, yeah. but like it still gave me the instructions on how to perform specific analyses. So it's saying that I use it for like analyses and how to like perform those. I use it for, again, literature reviews. I literally, it's for making this episode, learning. Yeah. Sometimes my students too will ask me questions in the courses that I TA, yeah. and quite frankly, I don't have an answer. So I say, you know what, that's a good question. Let me share it with the class. I'll post an answer for you on Teams. The reason why I say that is because I don't have an answer, but I look it up on ChatGPT and they're able to help me out. Sometimes I use uh, like ChatGPT or AI to help me like write emails or even like conversations because I'm like okay this is what I want to say but how do I change the tone or how do I make it more professional or how do I kind of also whatever information I have how do I change the language for a specific audience mm -hmm. sometimes and I think that's me using it maybe like in academia but in a sense of not research but more science communication and knowledge translation aspect of academia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in saying that that also brings up or highlights an important point about like plagiarism. Yeah and be balancing like, yes, we're using these platforms to like better our learning and help cater our, or improve our understanding of yeah. different topics, but it's not like the end all be all of where we're getting our information from. No, yeah, I agree. Even like for today's episode, I researched AI, I was trying to understand a bunch of topics and a bunch of like terms and whatnot. And I was trying to read it and understand, but I put it into ChatGPT and I was like, can you explain this in a very, for a lay audience. Like, mm -hmm. how would you explain it to a lay audience? And like, me reading that gave me a better understanding so I can kind of incorporate that into my own words and be able to explain it better, if that makes sense. So that's kind of me using it for, a, like, the science communication aspect, I would say. So it's also being careful of, like, not using it word for word, but being like, okay, this is me understanding what I know, okay, what they're trying to explain, let's put it together. Okay, now I have a better understanding of it. Rio, I'm gonna throw it to you for a quick second. What's your stance then, well you're on the verge of becoming a teacher and working specifically with high school students, mm -hmm. physics? Yeah. 
right? Science. Science in general. So like how, I don't know, like as you enter the profession and inevitably it's going to be a part of like the way that you teach probably, but also the way that your students learn, like where do you see it playing a role in your life? Um, I think a lot of the things teachers struggle doing is being able to break down concepts in like an understandable series of sentences. Mm -hmm. It's easy to put scientific concepts that are hard to understand and to put in chat and say, dumb down, mm -hmm. or like, help me understand this at a XYZ level. Mm -hmm. And then chat's able to do that. Um, I think telling students to like, try, try doing that when it comes to learning the concepts that they're learning in class. Another thing is being aware of discussion posts and making sure you don't have discussion posts that can easily be copied and pasted onto chat. Yeah. I find a lot of teachers that right now are doing that where it's so easy to just take the question and not put any input into mm. it on chat and mm -hmm. chat can answer it already. Um, last thing is like we've all heard of gram Grammarly. And yeah. we, I mean, I use Grammarly. So do I. But yeah. what I learned recently is chat is way better at Grammarly than what Grammarly is currently doing. If you have like a paragraph or a sentence that you have and you just say, what am I missing here? Or mm -hmm. enhance the flow and clarity or cut down the words so it reaches a certain amount. It's good at like removing clutter and adding grammatical corrections. So I think also introducing that to your student, to my students might be beneficial as well. I already have a professor that's already telling us to use chat right now mm -hmm. in our work and make sure to do it in our writing so it sounds cohesive and flows well. I saw a thing where a student had done, or had just used Grammarly just for her paper, I, I believe at like a university level or whatnot, but she was actually accused of plagiarism for using Grammarly or some, whatnot because I heard that too. it's like an AI and you're not, not supposed to use that, but even though she was using it for like grammar aspects of it. So what do you guys think about that? Like what do you, what is your stance when you hear that? Um. I don't know. I think there's ethics when it comes to who is reviewing your work. Like at a high school level, teachers encourage you to get other students to peer review your work, right? But do you add them to the citation mm. at the end when you're submitting your essay? Yeah. Right? I mean, it would make sense if you said chat reviewed my work at the end of your reference, but I don't know if that's going to be something that is required in the future. Yeah, because I mean in high school when we had like our English papers and whatnot, we were like, hey, can you edit this, mm -hmm. right, for grammar or whatnot. You don't really be like, oh, this person edited it, right? So if you use Grammarly and now you're being accused of plagiarism for like a spell check or whatnot, mm -hmm. how it's kind of like, okay, so should we be citing that we used such sources for that? Even if it's not for the actual content and quality of a paper, but for the just like spell check and grammar. Because, I mean, Microsoft Word or whatnot has spell check, mm -hmm. right? At what point do we say, okay, this is plagiarism, this is not plagiarism. We're using our resources versus not using our resources. I think it depends to like what extent you use ChatGPT. So for example, like within research already, like when you're publishing in a peer reviewed journal, like you don't give credit to the peer reviewers who review your work. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like an unspoken, not even unspoken, it's just like, the way it is like they review your work and if it's good enough then it gets posted so yeah or published like so in that capacity there isn't really a need to give credit necessarily mm -hmm. but it depends to like what extent chat gpt is informing your ideas i yeah. think that's where like the better legislation or rules or policies within journals and schools need to be established. I think it's still something relatively new to like AI and academia. Like of course like a year ago we did an episode sorry, an episode of AI mm -hmm. and a year later it's advanced so much more mm -hmm. than it was like a year the ago. Information we gave in that episode, I was listening back to it like it's out of date. Like yeah. it's a lot of it's not like relevant. Yeah. And it's yeah. just within a year, right? So it's also such a evolving field like every week there's something new there's a new app there's this there's so many ai resources now that can be used in academia that i think institutions are also navigating how to establish okay you can do this but you can't do this um i've even seen certain policies where if the professor says it's okay to use chat gpt then it's not considered plagiarism or they actually are telling students to use chat gpt for certain assignments so i think it's really interesting 
to see how institutions or even academia and the field of research kind of navigates that. Yeah. I have a question again for you, Rio. So in like the creation of questions for you know assignments that you're working on, how do you make it so that it's not easily susceptible to giving answers on chat GPT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, usually if you get the students to reference their work to a desired reading that you give them mm -hmm. or text, um, just getting them to cite a specific example in the text would gotcha. require more work for them mm -hmm. to to answer the question than just putting the question alone in chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. For um, a course that I TA um, last semester, um, we it's a course on um, statistics and epi, and the prof, um, Russ, like he was a me or like all the TAs and him were trying to think of questions for like final assignment work that weren't susceptible to being posted on um, or to being plagi plagiarized on chat GPT and we could not for the life of us figure out a way to mm. make it so that there was no way that anyone could cheat. So what we ended up doing was we did that. Um, we made students uh, reference specific readings and one thing that we did consider doing was placing a time limit on um, the students um, like, uh, what's it called? Like, ability to answer the question. But then okay. also, but then we thought against that because it just limited students' ability to th go over their work and think yeah. of their ideas mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff, which in the end could make the work that they're doing more susceptible to being plagiarized mm -hmm. because if they're low on time, it's like, oh, let me just go yeah. and chat GPT and let it figure it out for me because I only have 45 minutes left to answer like, yeah. a five page essay mm -hmm. but yeah that needs to be developed a little bit more but yeah no yeah i agree mm -hmm. and then uh, what else do you have uh, over here oh just yeah there's just like examples of ai in research in a sense of so i have one um example of basically using ai to understand climate change so scientists trying to understand how our planet's climate is changing essentially <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it. Thanks. Um, so they're collecting a bunch of data from satellites, weather stations, and other sources. But they, when they collect these data, then the algorithms analyze the data to identify trends and patterns, which help the scientists and researchers predict future climate conditions and assess the impact of human activities um, on the environment. For example, AI can analyze satellite images to track changes in ice caps or monitor deforestation in remote remote areas. Mm -hmm. That's actually really cool. Sorry, and another example is um, using AI to actually track disease outbreaks, which is really fascinating. So um, essentially disease outbreaks like COVID-19, um, scientists can actually gather data from hospitals, clinics, and public health agencies about the number of cases, locations, and demographics. And then the algorithms can actually process the data in real time, detecting clusters of infections, um, predicting hotspots, and guiding public health interventions. So AI can analyze social media posts and news articles to identify early signs of disease outbreaks and alert health uh, authorities to essentially take preventative measures for that. Slay. It's actually very fascinating. So slay. <laughs> any examples that you know or any applications that you were aware of? Oh, well, I think there's literally any yeah. area of research can lend itself to being <clears throat> um, benefited by AI. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of companies right now, um, or yeah, there's a lot of companies right now that are trying to figure out ways to use AI to write systematic reviews and um, uh, just like literature reviews and make it very discipline specific. So I know there's, um, you know who Mo Bandari is? He's um, a big guy at Mac for orthopedics okay. and um, orthopedic surgery and like he's one of the biggest researchers and most cited researchers in the world in that area. Oh. So right now he has a company called Ortho Evidence and he's trying to um, create um, this like program or software or whatever it is where it can spit out systematic reviews a lot quicker using AI. Okay. So it's like giving the AI the, tw the tools to perform systematic reviews and meta-analyses yeah. and um, using um, 
like the repository of evidence that he has available through ortho evidence and mm -hmm. other journals that currently exist and other data base um, publications that exist yeah and uh, to perform in systematic reviews mm -hmm. which can sometimes take like a few months to a year to write but with AI it could take I don't know like probably like a day or two or a week so would it essentially be writing the manuscript and doing the whole process itself, like AI? No, I, I don't know to what extent, because yeah. I'm not involved yeah, yeah. with um, his work, and yeah. I don't know, yeah, I don't know to what extent. I yeah. just know that um, someone that I know, their friend works for Ortho Evidence. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm, like, mistaken in saying this, but I think their goal was to have, like, a systematic review come out each week. Oh, cool! Yeah, so, like, just speeding up and a lot of yeah. other companies are doing this right now as well so it's sort of like within the world of research methods it's yeah. like a race to who can develop the most uh, effective and robust platform for performing mm -hmm. these searches because mm -hmm. like within evidence-based medicine yeah. systematic reviews and the sy synthesis of existing evidence is like the very top of the pyramid yeah. like it's the thing that we call the pinnacle of research so if you're able to output like a bunch of reviews very quickly that could inform evidence-based yeah. medicine very quickly and I'm sure. in practice i'm like there's clear advantages to it but i'm thinking of like the disadvantages of that well the do you have a couple that you want to <laughs> talk about no i'm just like actually thinking about like the specific example of there's any disadvantages nothing that's come to mind like the only i guess disadvantages i could think of ai's kind of straying away from that example, but just like ethical concerns where, I mean, like we said, AI is essentially the information that we feed it, mm -hmm. right? And humans itself have inherent biases and we are basically feeding it also our biases to these algorithms. And so when they are spewing out whatever information that we are seeking, they also might be spewing out the biases that, you know, we have. Yeah, it can promote systemic racism in the work that it outputs. There's a couple of examples of that actually happening with, um, I remember there was, I think it was on Twitter or X, whatever the heck it's called now, there was, um, Microsoft had an AI program that was like outputting its tweets, but then its tweets ended up becoming very, oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Anyways, the tweets that it was uh, producing ended up being like very racist oh. because it was drawing from information that was currently on Twitter yeah. and um, things that people were uh, posting about it and interacting with so uh -huh. then the tweets that were coming from it ended up being like loaded with uh, racism like oh, I mean wow. um Rio you were also saying an example earlier before we started this podcast about Canva what yeah was um one of my professors asked us to look at the biases that AI generators, image AI generators has have, and one of them was one of the platforms I looked at was Canva, and mm. for example, when I searched up produce an image that shows us scientists, it was typically white male men, white male men, white males, <laughs> white white men, white men. So you know there was definitely a lack of diversity and yeah, just contributing to the systemic racism that is really in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to to add to that the um, example just to give a little bit sorry were you done your thought yeah i'm done okay cool <laughs> i feel like my brain is every which way but um for the microsoft example i found an article that spoke about it from 2016 and it's titled twitter taught microsoft's ai chatbot to be racist to be a racist asshole in less than a day so it went from um well i'm not going to say some of these tweets because they're just horrible but like it went from being like the 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 microsoft chatbot it was called tay tweets or is called tay tweets i'm not sure if it's still called that but it went from saying like hi nice to meet you um humans are cool to saying some like pretty oh wow i'm not gonna say that on the oh gosh yeah so it's just we'll we'll, we'll cite the article in our references but that's nuts anywho but just to, I guess, wrap up this episode, um, where do you guys see then um, AI going within the next, uh, I don't know, like 10 years to, and how it could benefit within like, a, our students within an academic context or even researchers? I think what you kind of mentioned too, right, how they are using AI to essentially uh, create systemic, not systemic, oh my gosh, systematic review. Uh -huh. um, and they're using that to do that in a research 
like field. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to see how that would work in an institution like academia field of like students using it, right? Because there is that sense of plagiarism or not if you were to do that. So I'm curious to see how that would actually evolve in like assignments. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Rio, you got any thoughts um, on that? With the continued development and the evolution of AI, I feel like there's going to be like a continuous use of or release of carbon emissions and just mm-hmm. continuous sort of looking for like the environmental degradation, like the impact that yeah, it could have. Yeah, basically, basically. So like I don't know, we're we're so aware of climate change right now. Yeah. So I don't know if like activists are going to say like we need to put a halt on AI for a mm-hmm. bit or like find a more eco-friendly ways to like use AI. Like sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, that's like, that's something I keep thinking about because like we're moving towards a lot of like eco-friendly mm-hmm. uses of products and equipment. But like yeah. when it comes to AI, I feel like we keep overlooking mm-hmm. the idea of climate change and its impact. That's such a good point. Like quantum computing, for example, that's like the next or yeah, the next stage yeah. of um, like computer development. And that just uses so much energy, like it's it's insane. Yeah. So yeah, figuring out more sustainable ways of um, I don't know computer Using, science yeah. and AI and everything like that. That's super important. Um, and I guess for me, I don't know, just like embracing it more. Like mm-hmm. teachers that, for lack of better words, try to shun it and say mm-hmm. like think for yourself. Obviously, like students need to think for themselves, but. I don't know, if it could leverage your learning and create the opportunities for learning, mm-hmm. like, why not embrace it and just teach students more effective yeah. ways of u- utilizing it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But that's it for today's episode. Thank you for listening, as always. Drive safe. Bye. <laughs>